uh, let's get started with introducing our guest for today. Uh, our guest for today is Leah Zviglich, who is a serial entrepreneur who started her company at age 20. At age 20, ladies and gentlemen, she's a multi-time awarded CEO, was recognized by the White House Young Entrepreneurs Association. Since then, she has founded Aster Club, which includes Astri Family Advis uh, Aster Family Advisors and Aster Impact, which is a private world-class legacy club where some of the most affluent families in the world come together to collaborate on impact investing, building sustainable social enterprises, and she also advises in succession planning, successor development, and corporate governance. Leah Zviglich, however, is here today for a completely different reason other than business. Leah, take it away, please. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Okay, let me see if I can restore the screen sharing. Just a minute, give me a minute. Share. Okay, would you confirm if you see the screen? Yep, we do. Okay, so what today I'm here to talk about actually a very personal story. Um, I had a very unusual upbringing because of my parents who are coming from two countries who hate each other at the time when the country had really kind of ugly, bloody uh, part of the history. So that experience shaped me in different ways. And uh, I'd like to share the story. And I feel that currently this story is quite timely given what's happening in the world. Because in the world, everyone believed that we were heading toward the right direction when the cold war ended and we were going into globalization. But currently what's happening in the world is quite sad that uh, more people are hating one another. People are becoming very nationalistic and very local, domestic, and then creating more uh, walls around them and not accepting people who are different from them. And kind of this mentality is worrisome. And I thought when Mohammed suggested it would be a good story to share. So I'm sure that some of you had uh, watched movies like Engdoshin, the love story that happens with the backdrop of Vietnam going through independence and going through the, the communist movement and trying to, uh, to be uh, independent from the colonization of France. And then also the love story during World War II between uh, the German soldier and the French uh, lady. And there's a lot of stories like that, but you'll be surprised actually this kind of love story is not only in movies, it actually happens in real. So to give you kind of a background, I will tell you what was happening at the beginning of 1900 in Korea. So Korea, starting from about 15th century, it was under the, that like called Yi Dynasty. It was under the royal family of Li who ruled the country. And then 1910, and then what happened was Korea we used to be prospering country. Once they reached a period of prosperity, just like a lot of other kingdoms, they went into a kind of complacency. And then instead of uh, looking after the welfare of the people, uh, uh, people in the politics, they were more interested in their own interest, and there was a lot of politics, and they were fighting one another amongst them. So they were so busy fighting amongst them, they weren't paying attention to what's happening around them. And during this time, Japan was modernizing, and uh, under the Emperor Meiji, they were actively reaching out to outside world, trying to learn technology, trying to modernize the country, trying to develop the economy. And so the gap between Korea and Japan started getting really big. And it got to the point that Japan was powerful enough that Japan forced Korea to annex it, like merging the two countries. And during this time, Japan relocated about over 100,000 Japanese families to settle in Korea. A lot of them, they were given land 
And then over time, by the end of the occupation, uh, more than 50% of arable land in Korea were owned by Japanese. Um, and then a lot of Koreans were also sent to Japan or other colonies to work as laborers or doing a lot of hard work. Also during the Sino-Japan War, a lot of Kore Koreans were sent as soldiers. So there was a lot of anti-Japanese movement. There was a temporary government in Shanghai trying to gain the independence again. And then finally, when the World War ended, 1945, then the Korea became kind of independent, but not really because that time US and Soviet, they decided that, okay, since now Japan is gone, uh, we don't know who is in charge. So let's uh, US, take care of the South and the Soviet Union North. And that's where 38 parallel line began. And then uh, Korea in South Korea with the support of the US, they started a government in North with the support of Soviet Union, they started the government. And then of course, two of them, they did not agree. So the war began and then Korean war was one of the bloodiest war because, you know, the Chinese later, later got involved and, you know, they were going back and forth up and down the peninsula, destroying everything in the path. And when the war ended, Korea was one of the poorest country in the world. And then today you see Korea as, you know, well known for K-pop and Korean food and, you know, Korean movies and all those things, but it's been a long way, okay? And then Japan, uh, as I was explaining earlier, Japan studied with, during the Meiji uh, uh, period that they studied uh, industrializing the country. So it became a quite, a uh, strong economic power in Asia Pacific. So they had a uh, Russo-Japanese war, 1904-5, which Japan won. And actually this was one of the, uh, one of many reasons why Romanov uh, uh, family, the, the Tsar of Russia started going down because you know, losing that war to Japan was a really big hit and the lose of confidence in, in the, the emperor. And then the, during the World War I, uh, people don't realize actually Japan was a part of allied forces and they provided valuable naval forces to the allied forces because Japan had very strong Navy. And then uh, starting from about 1910, slowly Japan started expanding. And then actually I will show you the map here. When you see the map of where the Japan is and you can see why. So Japan is island and they are facing the Pacific Ocean. If you want to expand, there's nothing to expand into the ocean. What are you going to do expanding into Pacific Ocean? Because even Hawaii is very far and even Philippines is really far. So they started expanding into the continent. And when you want to expand into the continent, the best path is through Korea. And then in fact, that's one of the reasons throughout the history, Korea was a pathish way of Chinese empire and all that because Chinese, whenever they want to expand into Asia Pacific, they will invade Korea so that they can go to Japan and back and forth. So the Japanese ambition was first annex Korea and then from there then expand and conquer the whole China and then from there expand further. And then of course in the Pacific, they also invaded like Taiwan and Philippines and other countries, but the, their main ambition was uh, going to the main, main continent. So, so there was a, uh, there was a Manchurian incident, 1931-37 Sino-Japanese War, and then the big, uh, World War II began in Europe the same time, and then Pacific War started 1941 by Japan bombing the Pearl Harbor, and then finally nine, 1945 all ended. Um, and then uh, Japan, with the support of uh, the U.S. and uh, allied forces that started developing their economy. And then there was Olympic games in 1964 and you know, all those uh, developments. So 
you all remember about 1980s, Japan was a super uh, economy in the world and they were exporting a lot of things. People were flooding to Japan to learn their management uh, techniques. So that's the backdrop. So what happened was my mother is Japanese. So she was born in 1928. And even though she's Japanese, she's born in Korea because her family, her father, who was part of the Japanese military, was one of those 100,000 families who got relocated to Korea and was given a land and was asked to settle. So she was born in Korea. And then my father is born in Korea in 1929. And he was born in a family who have been a landowner for a very long time. Um, and then about three months after my mother was born, uh, her father decided that it's too dangerous for family to be in Korea uh, because her father was high ranking military officer and there was a lot of assassination, a lot of bombing because I told you the Koreans were trying to gain their independence. So they were trying to kill any high ranking Japanese people in Korea. So the family moved to Kyushu and after that, soon after that, 1932, her father died in Korea. He got assassinated. And the same time, my father also lost his father. Um, and then when he was 13, mother died. And then when my mother was in high school in, uh, in Japan, she fell in love with Korean boy who was studying law in Tokyo University. So in the previous slide, do you remember that I told you there were lots of Japanese that were sent to Korea. There were a lot of Koreans who were sent to Japan. So that's how they met. So she fell in love with him and they promised to, you know, love forever. And then the war ended. So as soon as the war ended, 1945, uh, the US came and then there was no ties between Korea and Japan because at that point, Japan did not have a country yet, was under the occupation of the US military. And then Korea also did not have any government. And then since Korea and Japan had such bitter history, that they concluded that it'll be better if there is nothing going on between two countries. So everyone who was sent to Japan were returned to Korea. Everyone who were in Japan were sent, um, so the, the, the people were returned to their home countries. Of course, some of people, they remain, but most of people, they were returned. And so my mother, who was madly in love with this Korean boy, uh, she was waiting and waiting and waiting and no letter. And of course, there's no letter delivery during that time. And she was waiting and waiting. And finally, when she was 20 years old, she decided that she waited long enough. And it doesn't look like two countries are going to do anything. So she decided to take uh, illegal boat leaving from Kyushu to Busan and uh, left everything behind and came to Korea to look for that boy. So I will show you the map here. So my mother is from Kyushu. So you can see from Fukuoka and Busan is the southern part of the, oops, it's the city in the southern part of Korea. So actually Fukuoka and Pusan, it's not that far. So even in old days with, the, uh, with the, the traditional boat, still this journey is done something very frequently. So she took the boat and then came to Pusan. And then my father's family was living here in the middle of Korea in Chungcheong, Pukdo. So my father's family and my mother's family, they knew from previous history. So she came and stayed with my father's family. And then while she was looking for the love of her life, Korean were studied. 
So she got stuck in the country. So during the Korean War, then she was, uh, uh, you know, uh, trying to escape from the war and she was staying with my father's family the whole time. And then when the war ended, that she found out that her lover that she was looking for died during the war, according to the record. So she was, of course, completely broken. Um, and she didn't know what to do because at this time, it's been already several years since she left home and since she run, ran away from home, uh, she wasn't sure if her family would take her back. And then again, we are talking about time where there's no way to communicate between two countries, even sending a letter, somebody have to cross that channel illegally and deliver the letter personally. So uh, communication with her family wasn't easy. And then she was quite uh, sure that her mother would not take her back. A daughter who ran away from home at age 20 and went to Korea because between Japan and Korea, because of the history, Japanese see themselves more superior and they see Koreans as inferior and running away to a poorer country, um, that won't be something that parents would be happy about. So anyway, uh, during this whole time, my father was in love with her, but knowing that she was in love with another man, he didn't have any courage to ask her out. But once he found out that her lover is dead and then she's not sure whether she wants to go back to Japan or not, uh, she proposed and she accepted and they got married. But when they got married, um, my mother had kind of a strange condition telling him that, you know, I am still in love with him. And my father said, well, it's okay. I, you are in love with a dead guy and I have no problem competing with a dead guy. I will, I will happily marry you. <laughs> so, so they got married. And then, <laughs> and then soon after they got married, my brother was born. Then my sister was born and I'm the youngest one. And actually they were quite content with a son and a daughter and I was an accident. <laughs> but what happened was their life was not normal. Actually, they couldn't live a normal life. So imagine the uh, Japanese lost war 1945 and then during 35 years occupation of Korea, they've done a lot of horrible things. Uh, so everyone hated Japanese, but this hate between Japanese and Korea, that's something that goes not just because of these 35 years. Throughout the history, there's been a lot of back and forth between Korea and Japan because of its proximity. And the fact that Korea is a pathway to the continent or a pathway to the Pacific, whichever way you look at it. So there's been a lot of conflict throughout the history. And there's a lot of claims that, you know, Japanese claim that we are the first, Koreans claim that, that we are the first. And, but in fact, the two countries, their history is like forever intertwined. Um, so my mother distinctively remember when she landed in Korea and got off the boat that she, I mean, she only had Japanese uh, clothing. So she was wearing kimono and she couldn't even get to the, uh, the train station without people throwing stones at her or spitting. So by the time she got to train station, she was covered with bruises and spits because, you know, she didn't speak a word of Korean and she didn't have Korean clothing. So only thing she had was Japanese kimono. And it was the worst time to be in Korea when everybody hated Japanese. So that kind of became an issue. And also on my father's side, when the family found out that my father wanted to marry Japanese, they kind of 
disowned him because they said, no, we cannot have somebody who has a connection with Japanese in our family. That's just not acceptable for the reputation of the family. So two of them, my mother who ran away from home in a country where Japanese are hated, and my father who married a Japanese woman against the family's uh, um, advice, both of them were completely isolated. So uh, my mother couldn't go out because, uh, for example, in old days, there was no supermarkets or shopping malls. So she had to go to the market to do grocery shopping. But market is the area where people who really su suffered from the Japanese occupation and Korean War are working. So she couldn't go to the market because then people were again throwing stones at her and yelling at her and giving her a hard time and they were harass her uh, because from her, she didn't speak very good uh, Korean. So people can tell from the accent and people also can tell from her mannerism that from miles away that she's Japanese. So she was afraid to go out. So all her life, she stayed mostly indoors. She didn't have any friend. She stayed mostly inside the house. And we were her children, but at the same time, her friends. And we were also her teachers because I was teaching my mother Korean. And I mean, we would teach her different things. Um, and that's how she lived. So the relationship between my mother and father I don't know if it's because actually maybe my mother wasn't meant to be with that the first boyfriend that she fell in love with. Maybe from the beginning, she was meant to be with my father. Or maybe it's because for between two of them, they are in complete social isolation. It's only two of them uh, that they have to rely on each other for everything because they are husband and wife, they are lovers, they are friends, they are cousins, uh, they are everything to each other. So uh, whatever the, the explanation is, over time between two of them, they develop some sort of like telepathy or uh, mental connection. It happened so many times that I've witnessed that two of them will think about same thing about the same time, and then they were good to do it. So in our home, we, yeah, we had a lot of funny episode of like all of a sudden we have too much of something because both of them thought about it all at the same time. And um, they had good relationship, but I would say also, I don't know what is the right word, like turbulent relationship and I think it's not easy, husband and wife, just being everything to each other. So when they fight, oh my God, it's like the end of the world. Because uh, to my mother, when my father is upset and not supporting or agreeing with her, I mean, he's the only person on earth that she rely on for everything. So it's almost like the end of the world. So yeah, when, when, they, when they fight, yeah, it'll be like the end of the world. And then when they're happy together, it'll be like heaven. And so I grew up seeing a lot of like a dramatic situations. But through the upbringing, one of the things that I learned is actually when you are in situations where people around you don't agree with you, don't support you, you actually have two ways that you can develop. One is you can take it internally and be hurt about it and you know be bitter about it. Another way is you make the best out of what you have. So my mother, she figured out how to live a life in isolation, without having friends, without even having the freedom to go out. It, so, I mean, think about it. If you think that during the COVID lockdown, a few months of lockdown was frustrating, think about doing that for all your life. 
And every time you go out, it's not just worrying about, oh, did I forget the mask? Actually thinking about, oh, if I go out where people again shout at me, throw stones at me, and it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to manage, but she kind of directed her energy more internally. So, I mean, we will have a lot of rituals at home that she kind of religious follow every day. So for example, in the morning when she wake up, she will water her flower. And when she water her flower, she will talk to flowers. She will give shower to each and every leaf and dry them <laughs> and things like that. So she found her own way to manage her loneliness. Uh, to give you the kind of a cultural difference, so one of the things that I noticed when I was about like studying about kindergarten, you know, old enough to understand the language and know the differences, there was a point I thought that my parents were crazy because uh, like my father would read me a story. Uh, so here I put some of the examples. So for example, animals in folk stories in Korea and Japan, they have completely different meaning. So my mother will hear a crow, you know, this black ugly bird uh, in the morning. And then she will be dancing around the house because it's a good luck in Japanese culture. Because in Japanese culture, crow is considered very smart and, and all that. And then my father will hear exactly the same sound. And then he will say, oh, today I have to be careful because that's a bad luck. And so you can imagine, you know, when I'm five years old, I get up in the morning, I hear the bird, I see the bird outside the window, and then my mom says one thing and my father says something else. And so it didn't make any sense to me because when you are young, you want to see, you, you have kind of a very simple logic of, is this right? Is that right? If one is right, the other must be wrong. And so, for example, fox in Japanese folktale is, it's always male, it's very wise and have magical power. In Korean folktale, it's always female, it's very cunning, it has a magical power, but in a very negative way. Uh, the fox will, especially nine-tailed fox, will always uh, pretend to be beautiful woman, seduce a guy and eat him or do whatever. Um, and then Japanese love cats, Koreans love dogs. And then Japanese folktale has uh, badgers a lot. Korean folktale has tigers a lot. And in Korean folktale, tigers are smoking pipes and tigers actually, you know, play with the rabbits. They don't eat the rabbits. <laughs> and um, one of the biggest cultural difference is in Korea, um, if, well, both countries, men are in charge of making money, providing for the family, especially for that generation. However, in Korea, wife is in charge of managing money. In Japan, husband is in charge. So my father will ask my mother to be in charge, and then my mother will feel kind of, why are you pushing that responsibility to me? That's your responsibility. And then even the decisions about children in Japan, father makes all the decisions about children. But in Korea, when it comes to children, mother makes it. And uh, another biggest difference is in Japan, you are the wife first, and then you are mother second. In Korea, once you become a mother, you are mother first. Wife is your second job. So there's kind of uh, the cultural differences that I learned. And as I said, at the beginning, I was trying to see who is right. Is mother right or father right? But then later I learned that both are right. They are coming from different perspective. So it gave me understanding of different perspective at very early age, because that was something that I have to deal with every day. But at the same time, both cultures have a lot of similarities. So both countries, uh, especially during that time, it's a very class oriented society. So Japan has like Meiji social structure, where there's a shoguns and there's a samurai and there's a merchant and all those things. E dynasty also had a very uh, rigid social structure. 
So because of that, both uh, cultures have very strong class-based prejudices. But um, at the same time, the values, both countries respect honor and integrity as one of the most important values. Uh, and then both countries respect seniority. So if you are older, you are respected. If you have a higher position, you are respected. If you are a higher class, you are respected and all those things. And then similar but slight difference is in Japan, everything is ritualized, whether it's eating, getting dressed, uh, drinking tea, uh, everything they try to ritualize and whatever your daily Monday thing is, it tries to give the meaning. And in Korea, uh, rituals are very important, but only for special occasions, not on every day. Um, so uh, one of the things that I did as a daughter growing up with parents who were bound by love coming from uh, cultures that hated each other throughout the history, surrounded by people who don't want to talk about it. What I did was when I was in college, I thought, you know, forget about old people because old people, their ideas are already fixed. They're so prejudiced. There's no way that I can change their mind. But let's start with young people. Maybe young people, if we start early enough, uh, maybe there's a way that they don't hate each other. Maybe they can understand and respect each other. And instead of criticizing that, maybe they can respect. So, for example, I told you, uh, like, I mean, this discussion goes even uh, today amongst everyone. Uh, Japanese love cat. Koreans are more dog lovers. Wow. Which is better? Actually, neither, because, I mean, cats are cats and dogs are dogs, and they are different. It doesn't, just because you love cats, it doesn't mean that you are superior or smarter, more caring, uh, just because you are uh, dog lovers that, you know, uh, it, it doesn't mean anything. It's just different preferences. So I think understanding those things is very important, not always passing judgment on things that doesn't necessarily need to have any judgment uh, or biases. So what I did is when I was in college, I studied a youth conference between Korea and Japan. And the first one was, oh my God, it was so hard. I was so criticized. I, I wanted to have the first meeting in Korea and I mean, I had difficulty finding anyone to sponsor it. Uh, and then actually some students were protesting against me saying that I am a, like a Japanese uh, informer or whatever. And so it was really difficult. So I don't know how many times I cried while I was uh, organizing the conference. But when I organized that, the first conference, Oh my God, I was so happy. And what I believed was right because young people, uh, so we invited a lot of um, young students from different part of Japan to come to Korea. And then we also invited Korean students from different part of Korea. And of course they didn't actually know each other very much because all the things that we know are things that we learned from uh, textbooks and textbooks are, as you all know, it's highly political. And uh, the things that you read on a newspaper also, you know, on the newspaper, they always talk about when something goes wrong. They don't always, you know, give you any education or give you any useful information that you can use of. So uh, during the conference, we really spend a lot of time trying to understand each other. And we set a lot of different topics and based on each topic that we exchanged our ideas. And by the end of the conference, there were so many friendships formed. And then also not only that, out of that, there were a lot of romances that happened. And then we repeated that every year and that conference still continues even today annually. And then out of the conference, 
every year there's some romances that's happening and then better understanding. So I would say even though if you look at the Korea and Japanese relationship, it is true that in media and in politics, it's still very tense. But when you look at a personal level, you will notice that there's a lot of improvement. And I do believe that actually any big movement or any big social change start from small things. So I would say my parents' love story that triggered me to be more open-minded and uh, understand different perspectives. And that's reflected a lot on the work that I do. And I also like to kind of spread the word that sometimes love is the best solution to solve big problems. So that's the end of my story. So I will answer any questions you might have. Thanks a lot, Leah. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a very inspiring story, uh, Leah. So when did you uh, move to, to the U.S.? Oh, I came to the U.S. at age 27 to go to graduate school. Okay. And what, what did you study? I studied organizational behavior, trying to understand people better, especially I wanted to understand what motivates people and how to develop people's potential. Wow. And, and uh, how did that decision, uh, how was that decision informed by your dad and mom? Was, was there any influence from what you went through as a kid? Uh, well, I would, I would say, yes, was since, since I was little, since I have to go through this kind of uh, uh, understanding different perspective, uh, I would say, yes, they influenced me in that way. I am always fascinated by cultural differences, but at the same time, I am amazed how similar people are, regardless of the culture, people are people. So the kind of contrast of similarities at the same time, differences is fascinating to me. Wow. And um, what did your, uh, what did, what was your father's profession growing up? Uh, he was, uh, well, he, He's, he was an architect, so he, at young age, he wanted to have his own company, but then he realized that being an entrepreneur is very difficult. So later he combined working for a bank and also still working as an architect, kind of doing uh, projects on the side. Wow. And, and what did you what did you learn from both both cultures? What did you learn from the Japanese culture and what did you learn from the Korean culture? Well, so the uh, so one of the things that I learned from the Japanese culture is uh, I mentioned earlier, Japanese are so good at turning mundane things into a rituals and giving meaning to it. And that's something that guided me a lot. So. Um, you basically you can turn anything into ritual. So let's say uh, getting up in the morning, it's something we do every day and you can just mindlessly do it or you can ritualize it. So there's a processes and steps and timing and all that. But actually today people talk a lot about mindfulness. It's all about mindfulness that all the things that you do uh, in repetition that doesn't have any meaning, the moment you ritualize and take charge, you pay attention to the details and then everything becomes more precious. So even uh, anyone who visited Japan will realize that, I mean, they package everything so nicely, like everything is, and then when you go to, so for example, when you go to American home, they will give you a big piece of uh, cake like gigantic pieces of cake, and then they will give it to you. 
in Japan, they will give you like tiny piece of cake and you look at it, it's like, wow, that's like half a bite. But they were presented in such a way that it makes you feel like you've got more than the whole cake. Wow. So I think that ritualization part of Japanese culture, I think it's wonderful, especially in today's world where the pace of life is too fast and we are distracted by so many things. And also there's a lot of temptation of fame and money and success and all that. I think that's really a wonderful part of it. Um, and then from the Korean culture, I would say Koreans have... Um, it took you a little bit longer to think of the Korean part. You're more in love with your Japanese side. I can, read, I can clearly <laughs> tell. <laughs> well, I would say I am more exposed to Japanese side because, you know, being, being a girl, I spend more time with mother. Okay. Um, and then the Korean side, uh, one of the things that I like about the Korean culture is Koreans are very... J Japanese are extremely group oriented. Everything is for the sake of the group. Koreans have that balance. Yes, also Koreans are group oriented society. And especially if you compare it with American society, uh, which is extremely individualistic. However, uh, there is a respect for individual. So in Korea, it is possible that you are a part of the group, but at the same time, you can be yourself. So for example, if I grew up in Japan, uh, I can imagine, I, would, uh, I don't think I could have lasted because I didn't fit in and I was this weird kid. But in Korea, it's like, well, if you're at school, as long as you are doing well at study, I mean, yes, Leia is a little bit weird then. Yeah, but it's perfectly okay. <laughs> so that kind of acceptance of differences. And then you can kind of now see it in Korean culture that a lot of creativity and innovation comes when you allow people to be different. When you are expecting everybody to conform with a group, it's very difficult to have creativity. So I would say I am actually thankful for that part of Korean culture actually allowing people to be a little bit crazy, a little bit weird, but it's okay. <laughs> so you would love to have the, the Japanese uh, ritualization and the individualization of the Korean culture. If you would yes, like so have the perfect. Actually, yes. So I find that actually there's a beauty in, because there isn't any one culture that has everything right. So being able to combine. So actually that's one of the things that I like to emphasize. Currently there's a lot of national tension. More countries are becoming nationalistic and criticizing another country. And even within the country, there's a lot of racial tension, but rather than seeing it as, oh, they are so different, I don't like them. If you open your eyes and try to see what they have that I don't have in my culture, uh, that would be a huge advantage for everyone. Great. Uh, I have a question here from Debbie Gispin. Uh, mm -hmm. I hope I'm answering, I'm saying her name right. Debbie Gispin. Uh, what do you feel from your unique cultural heritage has helped you in business and especially with your family office company advisory? Uh, so it definitely helped me uh, because, for example, um, well, I come from both parents who are disowned by their family. <laughs> so when I work with the family business, I also encountered that kind of situation because children did not follow what father wanted or grandfather wanted, the parent disowned them. To me, it's very personal. <laughs> <laughs> because I see what happens to the people who are disowned and then to the next generation. So it's not just a simple issue that I don't agree with you. You are no longer my part of my family. So I take that very seriously. And then currently the work I do, I work across the culture. So for me, understanding different culture, it's something that 
I feel very comfortable and actually I love doing that. So uh, I get excited whenever I have a client in a different countries because instead of getting stressed, like, oh my God, what's going to happen in this country? I don't understand. I get excited. It's like, oh, this is opportunity to learn about another culture. So uh, over the years, uh, I had... Uh, I had clients with, I think at this point, I experienced clients with all major religions in the world and some of the minor religions as well. Even some of the religion that people don't talk positively about, but when you get to know them and see from inside, you see different perspective. And then, yeah, the different cultures and all that. So to me, that's always fascinating and it makes my life very interesting and exciting. So, Leah, I, I would not let you go just yet. I want to ask you something. So uh, you've been an advisory to a lot of Arab family offices. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that you've witnessed your fair share of disownments. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to like, of course, we're not going to mention names, but uh, ha like how many uh, as a general percentage disownments were because of uh, a, a particular son or a daughter was getting married to someone out of out of the, the family business or out of the, 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 the immediate culture of the, of the family business? Oh, I would say, well, especially these days with a lot of uh, children of Middle Eastern families studying abroad in London, in Switzerland, in France, and in the US, I would say official cases will be about 20% of unofficial cases. Wow. And also because for me, when I'm coaching them, uh, when I'm coaching the children or different members of the family, I keep confidentiality with each and every person. So I don't share, but the person who is going through coaching with me will tell everything that's going on. And there's a lot of that cases that they have to make a decision. It's either doing what family expect me to do and give up my rights or I have to figure out how I'm going to manage my life alone. And it's, it's, it's a very difficult decision. And then usually what happens? Do they end up uh, succumbing to family pressures or do they usually uh, ride their own horses to the sunset? I would say there are more cases that eventually they follow the family's um, wishes because especially the families from Middle East, family, the concept of family is def very different from concept of family in America. Because uh, in America, when you say, okay, my father disowned me, you are talking about three people that maximum five people that you are not gonna talk to the rest of people are still going to be your friends and talk to you. But in the Middle East, where it's more of a clan mentality, when you are disowned by your parents, you lose about at least 200 of social connection, possibly even more. Yep. Uh, so it's, it's, it, it has a very different implication. Um, and then because of the way the economy, the social structure is, once you're isolated, it's very difficult. So I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily an issue of being brave or all that. It's, it's, life is, has its own challenges. So it's not that easy. I've seen some cases that once they decide to go with their own decision and separate from the clan, then actually in that case, it's easier for them to leave, remain abroad. Uh, and then they have to rebuild their whole social circle, their economic uh, basis and all that. So uh, it's very challenging. They are basically starting their life from zero. And what, what kind of differences uh, does, uh, does the Middle Eastern family have compared to the Japanese and the Korean family? Are they similar? Mm, no, out, uh, we're similar yet very different because Middle Eastern families, they are not just extended families, they are clans. 
because Middle Eastern families, they do a lot of things together amongst the extended families. They do business together, they work together. Uh, so it's a lot more integrated. In Korea and Japan, I mean, their ties with extended family is stronger than let's say American or European family, but they don't accept the family connection. They don't do that many things together. They are socially disconnected. So the dynamic is very different. And then actually Middle Eastern families and I would say uh, Latin American families are quite similar. Because okay, Latin so American families, ones. yes, because they also do things as a clan. Um, so uh, that's that's kind of very common. But I would say the F Middle East is still the strongest in terms of this clan mentality. Wow, stronger than Japan. Oh yeah, way 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 stronger. Yes. Wow. And actually, I find it stronger than even Africa. Wow, stronger than Africa as well, which is like very famous for its clannish mentality. Mm, I find Middle East uh, clan is the strongest one that I've seen, at wow. least based on my experience. Amongst the business families, what I see is that's the strongest. Wow, okay, we got one more question from Nikki Sakpoba. Uh, could COVID have a positive effect on this type of disownment in family offices, i.e. the pandemic has taught us all to appreciate family more? Not in the Middle East. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> I think like there were, um, I would say during the COVID, there were some people who started becoming a little bit more open-minded and understanding because the situation imposed. What I'm not sure about is once we start going back to normal, will they keep that perspective or will they go back? That, I, I am not sure. We will see when it happens. There is a the saying in Korea that what you had in your mind before you go to the toilet and when you come out of toilet, it's not the same thing. <laughs> what does the toilet have to do with anything? <laughs> no, no. So the thing is, you know, like, for example, when you're really, really in a rush that you have to go to the toilet. Oh, uh, yeah. And then you will say, oh, OK, you know, if if you allow me to go to the toilet right now, oh, I will do this and that and that. But then once you come out, it's like, really? No, I don't remember saying that. No. <laughs> <laughs> OK, final, final, final question. And this one is. Not to Leah, it's directed to uh, our founder, Mr. Mohammed Daej. Debbie Gispin is asking, question for Mohammed, we're missing the Middle East sushi. When are we all meeting again? Assalamu alaikum. First of all, I would like to thank Leah for her participation. I really appreciate it. It's very interesting. I got a lot of comment on my WhatsApp. Uh, Nikki and Debbie, yes, it will be 24th to 25th of October. Regardless if there is COVID, no COVID, vaccination, we'll do it. Enjoy. You guys are going to come swimming. Yeah. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have to wrap it up here. Leah, uh, it's been the greatest of all pleasures to, to listen to your story. Uh, very emotionally moving. Thank you very much. Keep up the great work. I'm a big fan of your foundation. Uh, Aster Impact, uh, keep it up, keep it up. The world needs you. Thank the world you. needs you. Thanks a lot, Leah. We're gonna be uh, we're gonna be moving on. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, very much, and thank you to our 91 uh, registered participants, 91 people. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we hope that Big Future keeps uh, becoming uh, this force for good in the community. Until next time. Uh, I hope you guys stay safe and love each other. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate it. The 91 people, you really made my day. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for organizing it. Okay. Thank bye. You. Bye bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you.